The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, preparing society and meeting the needs of an aging population. And now, here are your hosts. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, we have two people on the call with us today. We have two people joining us. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Carrie Brenner, who is a palliative care physician and a psychiatrist at Stanford. Stanford, welcome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. And then we have welcome back to the podcast, Danny Shamas, who was uh, with us in one of our earliest episodes. Um, She's also a palliative care physician and psychiatrist at UCSF. Welcome back, Danny. Hi, thanks for having me back. What was that first podcast you did? What was it about? It was on therapeutic formulations. Formulations. That was a that was a great podcast. And today, I like how you're just pretending that you forgot that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and today we're not going to be talking about therapeutic formulations. We're going to be talking about therapeutic presence. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and maintaining therapeutic presence in in the midst of this COVID pandemic. Um, uh, before we go into that, we always start off with a song request. Do you have a song request for Alex? We do. Um, but before I share our song, I just want to put out there the life lesson, but it is a terrible idea to ask two psychiatrists to analyze together what the right song should be. For <laughs> um, but after like a lot of psychological back and forth, I'm uh-huh. happy to report we landed on the brilliant choice of the theme song from the show Friends. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Good choice. So no one told you life was gonna be this way. Your job's a joke, you broke. Your love life's the OA. It's like you're always stuck in second gear. When it hasn't been your day, your week, your month, or even your year. Now we just got to all finish by dancing in a fountain. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And have the biggest apartment in New York City. Like a crazy world where a barista can afford um, this monster apartment. Therapeutic presence. Before we talk about how to maintain it in uh, a pandemic like the one that we're in right now, what the heck is it? So therapeutic presence is about the relationships and the connection that we cultivate with patients and their families that we feel is one of the most fundamental aspects of what we do within palliative care. We know that um, we actually have a very robust skill set already in our field, a developed way of thinking about things like symptom management and communication techniques. But yet we also know that there's this third element of what we do that has a lot of benefit and value to it. And that's therapeutic presence. We feel that the more that we can identify these skills and employ these skills, we can be catalysts of calm, catalysts of clarity, catalysts of consolation in this time of distress and anxiety. Danny, anything you'd add to that? No, I mean, I think she really nailed that one. (laughs) You know, (laughs) it's interesting because we know within palliative care that... Um, there's a lot of research that shows that our presence leads to significant improvements in quality of life and mood. And we also have a lot of research that shows that our involvement helps promote better, more adaptive coping within our patients. Mm -hmm. And therapeutic presence is something that we think is one of the key features that leads to these beneficial outcomes in our work. Mm -hmm. Now, when I hear the term therapeutic presence, um, I'm like, it seems ineffable, you know, like, like, what is this? Like, I know when I'm working with trainees, some of them have a therapeutic presence. (laughs) Some of them put on a show like they are trying to have a therapeutic presence, but it comes off as insincere, 
um, not genuine, um, you know, and, and, and patients often can sense it. Um, you know, and other times there are other uh, folks I've worked with who just do not have a therapeutic presence. <laughs> and, and it's like, uh, I don't know, you know, it's just it, and sometimes it has to do with the, the particular relationship they have with the patient because every, you know, dyadic relationship is different. Um, so for some patients, they may come across as therapeutic and some not. Could you say a little bit more about like what? What are kind of the key ingredients of a therapeutic presence? I was just thinking back to your take out the trash video, Alex, where yes, uh, exactly. Alex actually used all the palliative care uh, communication mnemonics out there um, in his discussion with his wife about who should be taking out the trash. Um, <laughs> it was not therapeutically present um, for his wife in that cartoon. Carrie, do you want to start with this one? Well, I would say we can, to be really practical, we could break it down into three sort of core features and active ingredients. And the first one is being deeply attentive. We are present in a way where we have the ability to sit with this and to not be terrified in the face of being with patients who have serious illness. Um, we are attentive in a way that's undistracted, that's non-judgmental, that's receptive. We're totally present in the moment. We pay attention to the nuances of what's said. We also are attuned to what's unsaid. We are deep listeners. We allow for silence. We know that slowing things down a bit actually allows us to get there more quickly. And this process of being deeply attentive it allows us to identify patients' strengths, to bolster their coping skills, and to problem solve with them in a much more personalized way. Yeah, I mean, Eric, I like, I distinctly remember the very first patient that I saw with you when I was a third year medical student. Oh, God, are you going like, to tell me how untherapeutic presently I was? <laughs> Something like that. No, no, no. <laughs> Like, no, it hopefully it was not playing like angry birds uh. <laughs> well, was, no um i mean i don't know if you you probably don't remember i don't know if you remember it was like this sweet guy who like all he wanted to do was go on an alaskan cruise with his honey he always called her his honey um but yeah i see it in your face you remember him no but what <laughs> what has actually like stuck with me for a decade what i remember was like the way that you pulled up a chair and sat down like you were sitting down with a dear friend. Literally, like there was nobody else in that world or that hospital except for this guy. And I was floored. It was just a striking contrast to what I had seen as a third year med student so far. Um, I think it might have been when I decided to go into palliative care and you've sort of been stuck with me for like 10 wow. years. I think that was the same case where... Um we actually sat down and we like we used all the same like the things that we we're supposed to use in palliative care. Like, tell me more. What would that look like? And then one day, um, another person came in and told the same story to somebody else. And the only word out of that person's mouth was, "Well, that's certainly not going to happen. Um, let's talk <laughs> about something that will." Uh, that was yeah. not therapeutically present. <laughs> that was not. Thankfully, that other person wasn't you. <laughs> So it sounds like some of those elements are things that we can teach. Like you were talking about, we are comfortable with silence. We slow things down and we get there faster, actually, when we slow things down. So is that is is this something in your palliative care training, in your psychiatry training, where would you say you learned the most about therapeutic presence? And was it qualitatively different between uh, psychiatry and palliative care? I think that the, our, our background with, I mean, Danny and I have many things in common. We're both psychiatrists and in the space of palliative care. And one part of our training as psychiatrists is that it allows us to have an awareness and to actually bring words to what's happening in the room and in these dynamics with patients and their families. And there's a lot of power in being able to identify that because when I'm in the world of palliative care, I see all these therapeutically present things that people are doing. And so the ability to identify those dimensions of it can be helpful. And I'd say actually you guys in this discussion, you guys are hitting on what I would call sort of the second key ingredient to therapeutic presence, right? Because we talked about being deeply attentive. And yeah, Alex, I do think we can teach that, right? There's this urgency to do and we can teach people to stop 
doing, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then Carrie, I think you're getting into the second ingredient, which is like we name people's core experiences. Yeah, that right? ability to name the core experience. And by naming, I don't mean this kind of um, superficial naming, like, oh, that must be hard. I'm talking about real naming where we actually are able to put to words what otherwise is sort of that angst or nameless dread that patients and families might be experienced. Because we know that that ability to name something, to put it to words, to bring it to expression, actually allows it to be less awful where suddenly patients and families are able to feel more accompanied and supported by us, where it's a shared burden. By naming, we courageously go right into it and don't leave people alone with their fears. Mm-hmm. Now, can I clarify that? Because so, I mean, I see a lot of communication frameworks out there, especially with this COVID pandemic. A lot of people are talking about these different frameworks. All of them have some type of, you know, empathize, emotions, and a lot of the naming is like, let's just practice saying that sounds like it's been really hard. Yeah. You're saying that maybe there's more to, more we, we should be doing. Can you tell me a little bit more? Yeah. Tell me more. <laughs> oh, I love that psychiatrist <laughs> line from you. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, Carrie and I actually agonized over if we should even call this naming because it's such a distinct thing we are talking about. We're talking... <laughs> asterisks, go to my podcast about formulation. We are talking about identifying the core struggle, the core experience that someone's talking to. So you're sitting in a family meeting and there's a million anxious questions. We're not talking about saying, oh, I can see that you're really anxious right now. We're talking about saying, it is totally petrifying to think about living in a world without your father. Right. We're talking about taking in everything we notice being attentive, digesting it for them and handing back what we think is the biggest, putting meaning to their experience, putting words to their experience. Two minutes later, I might be sitting in a totally different family meeting with a million anxious questions. And again, I'm not going to say, I can see that you're anxious with them. I'm going to say, I can see that it's totally petrifying to have to wonder if these doctors are missing something that actually could be working here. Mm. right? Because I've taken in all of this stuff I've gotten in being present and sitting with them. And I feel like I've tapped into the the biggest struggle, the biggest distress that they have. And that's what I put words to, right? And what happens when you do that? You guys have been in a meeting and had that moment when you, you hit the nail on the dot with what they're experiencing. What happens in the room? I notice there's usually tremendous relief. Yeah. I was going to say relief too. Yeah. And that, that things slow down and quiet and we're able to sort of get to the yeah. deepest struggles and therefore the deepest parts of the solution. Yeah, there's often a, a release of emotion. And um, when you get it right, because sometimes yeah. you get it wrong. What happens if you get it wrong? You go out on a limb and you try and put it together and they're like, no, you don't understand me. Well, and, yeah. that's, and that's a part of why we, you know, we also believe in process. So this, this um, is, it's not about perfection. It's about connection. So when we, when we're off a little bit, we get that feedback immediately from patients and families. And that's just more data for us to connect more authentically and more deeply with them to try again. So it's not about perfection. It's about connection. Totally. And if I say the wrong one, then the anxious questions are still coming. You just, you won't feel the shift in energy in the room and you're like, got it wrong. And you you (laughs) try another one. Are there other words that you use when you get it wrong to try to figure out what is... When you get it wrong, I would almost, in my mind, go back to ingredient number one, being deeply attentive, Mm -hmm. right? You, your job when you get it wrong, and again, where it's it's so hard to split these things apart. We're a little bit back into our formulation talk. Um, but your job when you get it wrong is to sit and take in more because you've obviously digested it a little bit off. You haven't actually been attentive enough to understanding what their core struggle is. So go back to ingredient number one. And then when it congeals into something else that's new, you put it out there and you see if you got it right again. Okay, I got a, I got another question. Um, going to Alex's question is like, is this something that we can learn? Because I certainly have days where I am flustered, I'm running around, and mm-hmm. I am not 
therapeutically present. Um, <laughs> what are there things that I could do in practice to actually get better at this? Better at being therapeutically present, or better at getting getting the right core experience? No, just better at like just going back to to one. And your your number one was being Deep, just present, deeply present, yeah, deeply, deeply attentive. Yeah, attentive, deeply attentive. Yeah. See, I, I should. I gotta be more deeply attentive right now. <laughs> See, my, I how, love how, which one of the most deeply attentive people I know is asking to get better at. It. How, how? What can I do to practice being deeply attentive? So it's a process of deep listening. And so some of it is involved. I, I have certain things that put me into that space. For example, I have this little portable chair that I carry with me through the hospital on my inpatient consults. And when I carry that chair around and sit right with the patient, that's my signaling device to myself that I'm going into that space, that zone where that patient in front of me is the center and focus of all my attention and energy. And so uh, some of these practices can help us get into that space. Um, you know, right now we are being flooded with new rituals of hygiene in our life. These cleaning rituals of, you know, sanitizing our hands, washing down surfaces, donning and doffing. How can we actually optimize these rituals to put our minds and our emotional energy focus into a different space to be more present with mm. patients? Oh, that's good. And I would say, you know, like um, that super irritating advice when people talk, because we hear a lot about mindfulness and palio care and meditation. And I feel like people are always like, just, you know, let it go and come back. It doesn't matter if you go a million places, let it go and come back. It's that simple. It's that simple. It's that simple. But when I think about being attentive, it kind of is like that simple. Just try to stop getting anything done, right? Mm. Just, just try to be there with the person because mm. we all know how to listen. Like I have not met a palliative care provider who doesn't know how to sit and listen yeah. and take it in. So just let go of any other agenda process and you'll be fine, right? Can I, forget can about I, your wife or your kid or your to-do list. Well, there's one more thing that we need to forget about that I find is increasingly interrupting. And, uh, you know, the trainees I work with get younger every year and I see more and more of this and this is it. This is what happens. Sorry, just one minute. Um, yeah. sorry. Just, okay. um, for those who are listening, Alex is on his phone. Oh, yeah. um, I'm on my phone. Right. Yeah, that's true. That doesn't come across on a podcast. It well, does, does not. <laughs> right. The they we can put phone. those phones on. Do not disturb. <laughs> right. The phone is a major interruption. Um, yeah. Um, even in these meetings. Um, I would say that the minute the med student starts the rotation, just be clear, like, if the phone comes off and out in a meeting, like you can't get honors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but we will even, um, as a way, as an attendee, try, try to create this holding space, the holding space for um, us to facilitate. I will take the pager or from my trainees and say, "Put your phone on silence. I'm taking the pager because I want you to be able to create this space." Yeah, so that that sort of does bring That's us good. into the third um, active ingredient of therapeutic presence, which is creating a holding space. And that's another key ingredient of our work where we actually hold what we are hearing and what we are see receiving. We hold this distress in a way where people feel heard and they feel understood and we model how to bear these things while still staying intact, while still staying hold. We, we model how you can hear and receive these things without falling apart. So in this way, we actually become containers of the intense affect and emotional turmoil that might feel uncontainable to the people around us. And a lot of folks have written about this. I know that um, there was a JPM article um, called Therapeutic Holding that came out in February by Linda Emanuel, Vicki Jackson, Leah Rosenberg, and myself, um, where we wrote about this dimension of our work within palliative care, creating a holding space. So we'll have a link to that article on our Jerry Pell podcast um, show notes. But um, <laughs> wh what does that actually look like? Like, how, how, how do what I is hold? a holding space? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to figure. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Danny. No, it's good. I mean, because I will say like oh, the holding space is like revered in psychiatry. We love the holding space. You know, when in 
internal medicine, when you guys like when in doubt, just guess lupus. It's like in psychiatry, when in doubt, <laughs> like create a holding space. So the holding space is, oops, sorry, your hour is up. That's, that's not the holding space. <laughs> no, no, not quite. But no, um, I personally can't think about holding spaces without thinking about parenting. They're totally linked in my mind. And because I know already that you're both parents, Alex and Eric, I'm going to actually um, put you on the spot right now with a parenting multiple choice quiz. All right. Are you ready? <laughs> All right. Ready. Definitely. So here's, this, here's the question. Your kid has like some activity that they're super excited about, right? They can't wait to do it. And then something unexpected comes up that you have to deal with. Maybe, for example, it's a, you know, pandemic last lesson. minute work meeting. Yeah. Maybe it's a global pandemic. Exactly. Right. Mm. And your kid is super upset. They're pissed. Do you a brush it off and say, eh, just get over it. Don't be so weak. B let their overwhelm worsen your overwhelm and yell, you know what? Daddy's upset too, kiddo. All right. And your attitude isn't helping. So quit <laughs> whining. Definitely. Right? That sounds okay. about yeah, right. That sounds <laughs> good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, there's a C. The okay. <laughs> oh, man. C, say something like, gosh, you know, I imagine this is really disappointing and frustrating, right? It's, it can be a really big letdown sometimes when plans change. Are you sticking with B? Uh, I, I think the answer is C. Um, I think I automatically go to B. Um, uh, although I've been trying to be more mindful lately, especially in the last couple of weeks, to try C out more. To try C out <laughs> Just more. to be mindful before I go into B. But it's really hard. Not to go to B. Well, I, I mean, in fairness, we've all done all three, right? Just depending mm -hmm. on our state of mind. But yeah, C, the last one is the only one that creates a holding space, right? It sends the message. I see how you feel. I get it. It's okay for you to have this feeling and I'll hold it with you. Right. And Eric, even though you're joking that it can be hard to do this with our kids, you are doing this all the time with patients, right? Like when, when you're watching a cancer patient get some kind of bleak diagnosis, how many times have you said, Hey, look on the bright side. Never. Yeah, never. 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 I don't right? think we, do that. Hopefully, hopefully. we don't do that. But you probably also, I'm hoping, haven't like started sobbing and getting super upset about it. And like the patient has to come and wipe your tears, right? Instead, you work to make this safe place for their pain and their loss and really like their whatever they're feeling, right? And you try to carry those feelings with them. And that safe place that you've made for them to have the feeling and to have someone on their side holding that feeling, that is the holding space. Mm. And we yeah. know that patients go through this roller coaster of emotions with serious illness where, you know, I was with a patient just this week who had metastatic pancreatic cancer. We were talking about him going home on hospice one moment and he knew he had weeks to live. And then the next moment he's talking about wanting to see his daughter graduate from college in three years. And we have this ability to hold that, hold all of those hopes, worries, fears, emotions with patients. And we know that these are normal reactions. It's a normal part of the process of integrating serious illness into our life. And the ability to be present with that with patients is, is the holding space that we create with them. This is really important. Really, um, it's, I think, the most abstract of the three key ingredients um, yeah. Deeply being deeply attentive, naming and the holding space. Um, I like the term holding um, because it makes me think of, you know, sort of like holding your baby or, okay. you know, <laughs> just, uh, you know, holding them up, um, creating a container for their emotion. Um, uh, That's exactly what it is, Alex, <laughs> because mm -hmm. I, I can tell you that, it you know, in moments of stress, when we're feeling vulnerable, it activates that need for attachment within all of us, the need to feel that connection and physical presence when we're children, and it's an emotional connection when we're older. And that brings us a sense of security and consolation to integrate this new reality of serious illness. 
And yeah, like you kind of sound like a psychiatrist. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you want to like go back to residency, but like Freud is somewhere being like, yes, yes, he hasn't gotten to the womb yet, but yeah. You know, but, um, That's hilarious. So uh, I really like this this holding because um, I got to say that there is part of me, and I think for, for a lot of physicians, like we we can do the naming, and then we want to fix what we just heard in the naming. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. like, oh, this person's really sad. I got to make them feel better. And I got to say, like, that's not just like, we we do this with our children. And like, I guess that's another thing that, that, that takes some practice to get over is this, this fix it mentality. I I have to, and, and we even see this with like cancer patients and even how hard it is to talk about this with friends and family. Cause everybody just wants to make them feel better. And yes. I'm getting a sense also this holding is not, I'm not going to try to make them feel better. Because I think we also know, Eric, that that kind of, you know, being Pollyanna in our approach, that false reassurance gets us nowhere. <laughs> if only that worked, if only yeah. that were helpful. I think we we all desire that. And we know that there are more effective things that we do within our work that help patients cope. And one of them is actually the being able to help them embrace the paradox of living well while acknowledging their mortality and acknowledging the reality of getting sicker and dying and mm-hmm. helping them hold that paradox of how do you hold both at the same time both mm-hmm. living well and an awareness of our mortality and that's a very hard psychological task to do mm-hmm. and a part of our work with them is gradually gaining the ability to integrate that mm-hmm. And I would say like, um, Eric, that, that urge to do something, like, I think we have to reframe sitting with that moment, sitting with that feeling as doing something, right? We're showing this patient, we can tolerate this feeling. I can tolerate this feeling. You can tolerate this feeling. When I work with trainees, like if I could blanketly just give one feedback about that moment when people jump in, it's like, just edit out the last line right? Everybody always gets there, right? And you can feel it in the room and it's sad or it's somber or it's something. And then there's this urgency to like, but or but we can do, you know, to put something in and it's because it's hard for us to tolerate. And so the concrete thing we can do, the concrete thing trainees can do is just take out that last line and tolerate it, right? Because the patient you're sitting with is going to have to tolerate that feeling, you know, long after you leave the room. So you can tolerate it a little bit longer, and you're um, modeling that you can actually take it in without falling apart to that you can take it in and still remain intact. Mm-hmm. I, so I, I'm hearing echoes of Vicki Jackson, who Carrie and I trained under at, um, in Boston, MGH. I remember her saying, you know, what is the patient's reaction when you jump to reassurance? When you jump to reassurance, you're showing them what I'm so stressed out about this. I can't deal with it. And if, if your yeah. doctor is so stressed out about it that they can't deal with it, they have to jump to reassurance, it must be worse than I thought. It must be, you know, this must be a horrible situation. You're right. Yeah. Vicki's one of my, she is one of my absolute main mentors in this space. And she has taught me that you don't flee from the distress, you don't avoid it, and you also shouldn't be consumed by it either. Mm-hmm. And so we walk that fine balance. Mm-hmm. And any other tips before we move on as far as, again, like Alex said, the, the holding seems also like, I think the hardest part. Any other tips on, on how we can do this? I guess the one tip that I would want to say is I hear you guys are like, I've worked with you. You guys are amazing. So you're very humble when you speak. But I would also want to say in palliative care, we're doing it a lot. I see people doing it so much. So in a way, I want you to like, I want us all to give ourselves more credit and just be aware of the fact that we're doing it. Because I think the more we can notice like, hey, I think I might have been creating a holding space in there for a really long time. The more that we have a language and point it out, the more we're going to see that like, this is something that we do, that we're able to do, that we can keep cultivating. If that makes and sense. I would say a lot of the communication techniques that we've been trained in um, are... Um, 
ways that we facilitate this. So when we say that we're hoping for the best and preparing for the wor- worst, we have a plan A and a pan- plan B. We use the word and instead of but. Those are all ways that we help model holding the paradox and creating um, a space for all of the fears, hopes, and worries. So I, I was kind of joking earlier about kind of Alex using uh, all our palliative care um, mnemonics in the take out the trash video. We'll have a link to that too. <laughs> but do you worry that, you know, I have the spikes mnemonic, I have the, this mnemonic, I'm going to follow it. And like Alex is saying, it becomes almost robotic and it actually potentially takes away from your therapeutic presence. You're, you're so deeply concerned about what you're going to say next that you're no longer listening. I can tell you right now that Carrie is probably thinking, oh no, mayday, mayday, don't start talking to Danny about this topic because I feel (laughs) so strongly in my like uh, resistance towards the presence of mnemonics in the field of palliative care, which don't exist anywhere in the field of psychiatry, Um, you know, or like you got an N-U-R-S-E and it's just um, deep breath. It's something that I have a resistance towards. And I think just for that reason, I think at their core, the mnemonics are well meant, like well meant. And I don't want to throw them under the bus because when we use them, they actually help us do these things. But yes, I think there's like a little bit of a like, you have to go from the N to the U to the R to the S to the E, you know, of a mnemonic that, that actually takes us out of the present, makes us less attentive. Um, I can see you're oh, frustrated. <laughs> I know. No, I know. <laughs> that was that a was wonderful me. way to name the core struggle, Eric. <laughs> well, the core struggle. No, I would yeah, say um, that this <laughs> element that we're talking about when we're discussing these active ingredients, it actually um, gives us the ability to know when to use these commu- communication techniques and in what way to use them and how to use them. So it's a bit of the undercurrent of like what's the core struggle here and um it allows us to know the when and and the why yeah i would almost consider the techniques as like a pantry of ingredients but not as a recipe and i think that's where we get it wrong sometimes we have to teach the techniques people have to know what they can pull for but this idea that like you do them sort of in a formulaic recipe way i think is somewhat flawed so okay so let's do reality check here so therapeutic presence this is all great love hearing about this love learning about this but (laughs) i'm gonna say but instead of and but (laughs) we're in a we're in the midst of a pandemic here we're communicating with patients via phone via video, via iPads to the, you know, ICU room, across a glass wall. Baby monitors, a lot of baby monitors. Yeah, with family members who we haven't met in person, who aren't seeing patients in person. What 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 do you see as, um, you know, issues with maintaining therapeutic presence in the midst of this pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can see, Alex, you wear glasses, so you can feel me when I say, if I put on a mask, it's not fitted right, right, then my glasses fog up and unfog, fog up and unfog like Darth Vader is in the room. But yeah, there's like a literal and metaphorical six feet between us. And I think that is one of the two key things that is very, very different in the setting of this pandemic, right? We can't practice in the same way that we normally do. We can't connect in the same way that we normally do, right? What happens when you put those three ingredients that we talked about together? You get connection, right? You get connection. And connection is so deeply protective of the psyche of a person's mind when they are under stress. And so I think this virus is especially cruel because it says, hey, I'm going to make you super vulnerable. And then your necessary response is going to be something that takes away connection, that takes away probably the number one buffer to vulnerability, right? I would say before, I do want to get into the key things, but I want to take a moment to make sure we mention, I think the other main thing that is so different right now in a time of pandemic is that, um, that we are experiencing vulnerability, right? There's usually a very clear line in the sand. You're the patient with cancer, mm-hmm. you're vulnerable, and I'm coming in, not with cancer, to help you, 
right? Or you're the primary team. You're struggling with this super intense, really difficult family. And I am the consultant coming in to help you because you guys are overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. right? That's not going on right now. This pandemic is sparing nobody, right? You could get sick. I could get sick. Our colleague could get sick. Our loved one could get sick. We're all vulnerable to this, right? And then there's this concurrent like uh, pandemic of anxiety that has really spared nobody. It's probably been more contagious than the virus, right? It's touched us all. We're left with this uncertainty and this fear and all this change. And it's it's in us all, right? I don't know why I'm thinking about this, but so like, I'll tell you that against my better judgment, I am in like a bunch of online mom groups, right? And there's like really nothing in the world or so I thought that's more addictive and anxiety inducing than being in an online mom group. Or that's what I thought until I started joining online physician COVID groups, right? Mom groups are like little league compared to online physician COVID groups. (laughs) And I think it's... It's true. And I think it's really because like, you know, people are, pan- it's like panic is spreading like fire. Can I touch my kids when I get home? Or should I live in the same place? And do I have this? And can I test it? And do I have masks? And it's just this like anxious, addictive beast, right? In addition to that, we, you know, there's evidence now, we saw the JAM article from the end of March that showed how the mental health outcome, um, mental health outcomes of healthcare workers in China, where it showed that 45% of them experienced significant anxiety, a third had insomnia, 70% of them had emotional distress. And so there is this sense of vulnerability within all of us. I mean, I think I had all three of those yeah. <laughs> pretty much yeah. every single it's day. A- I think that does lead us to, you know, a lot of my colleagues, as I've been talking about this in different settings, have asked, you know, how do I keep myself intact? How do I keep myself grounded? How can I first be a therapeutic presence to myself before then being able to give this to others? And, um, you know, Danny and I have tried to think a lot about that piece of it in terms of how do we keep ourselves grounded? And we've come up with some practical tips for that too. <laughs> yeah. And I do want to say, because I think Alex, you did ask a question that I forgot to answer. So, <laughs> so I will answer it before we go there. But I think your question was like, how do we give a therapeutic presence when there's a million barriers in the way? And I would say that it's almost like we're chefs being asked to cook in an unfamiliar kitchen right? So the rules of the game are different. And yeah, at this time in palliative care, we need to be really, really, really mindful about reaching to those core ingredients that we know work, Mm. right? And finding ways to do them. I think we as a field have to think deeply about what we want our presence to be in this pandemic. What do we want to be offering, right? We care, about protocols. We care about treatments. We care about predictions. We care about all this stuff that our colleagues are talking about. But maybe, just maybe, there is something else that we are uniquely suited to be giving right now that others can't give quite as well. And that is therapeutic presence, Hmm. right? So let's pull on those things, right? Deep connection, right? Panic is spreading like fire. So we still have to be mindful of slowing things down, Mm. bringing attention, right? We can still do that with all these barriers as long as we're intentional about it. It's not going to come as easily. We have to remember, right? Naming the core experience. I don't know, like we have to find a way to do it right now in a way that doesn't invalidate it, but also doesn't incite extra panic, right? So I don't know who's listening right now, but I think all four of us here are going to take a moment to name for you, right? All of our colleagues who might be listening, we have heard you guys, right? We hear your pleas and we hear your anger and we hear your fear and we hear your, you know, oh, your tragic stories that you're giving us. And yes, yes to it all, right? This is deeply scary. This is unsettling. This is upsetting, mm-hmm. right? We have to be the voice right now saying that in palliative care. I would add, I mean, Carrie always likes to call us heroes of uncertainty. And I think we are, right? We have to be mindful of being the person who logs into the Zoom meeting or goes into the whatever meeting it is and holding on to the message of we can do this. We can tolerate this uncertainty, right? We can walk down a path where we can't see three feet ahead. 
we've been doing this with patients all the time, right? Mm -hmm. They're waiting on their scans. Has their cancer come back? Has their cancer not come back? Mm -hmm. We're not sitting there and trying to guess the scans with them. We're trying to do this for them. We're trying to say, yeah, this is hard. We don't know, but I can walk this path with you where I don't know what's coming three feet ahead. So that was two ingredients. So ingredient number three, and we have to create a holding space. Mm-hmm. And I think, Carrie, you started talking earlier about when you put on your masks or when you log into the Zoom meeting or whatever it is, like, let that be a ritualistic cleanse, like put aside myself, put aside whatever craziness is going on in society so that I can be fully present and create a holding space for whoever is needing it right now in this interaction I'm going into. It was a long way of saying, Alex, I think the answer is that we do the same things. We just are forced to be a lot more intentional about it because we can't go on autopilot Mm because the rules of the games are different. Yeah. Um, That was a beautiful, beautifully said and an an inspiring message for um, folks in geriatrics and palliative care who are listening to this podcast about our potential to do this work. It's not so different in some ways from what we've been doing all along. Carrie, what else would you add in terms of practical tips that our listeners can take away? I think that I I ask myself a lot, if I'm going to be a container for others, how can I keep my own container from leaking? What can I do to be grounded? What can I do to, what can we do to manage our own anxiety? So there are a few things that stand out. One is um, process partner. So who is my inner circle of support? One of my, (laughs) one of my um, mentors in this space um, uses the analogy of if you with about mountain climbing and being on belay. She says if you're climbing a mountain into uncharted territory, it would be utterly absurd to climb a mountain without being on belay, without having somebody supporting you on a rope where if you started to stumble, you wouldn't go and fall too far. Mm -hmm. And so I often ask myself, who is my belay professionally and personally? Who can I rely on to vent, to laugh, to worry, to hope, to fear with? So I can climb into this uncharted territory when I'm doing my work with patients. Um, The second thing that I do is um, I, I... find it very, very helpful to focus on my immediate spheres of influence. I think that for all of us, we have a lot of altruism that brought us into this work. And using that, though, to harness our energy, to focus on what are the immediate needs before us right now. So for me, I was on my inpatient consult service at Stanford this past week, and my immediate sphere of influence was that list of 20 patients and families and the bedside nurses and the referring clinicians and trying to provide a therapeutic presence for them in those moments this week. Mm. And then when I'm at home, that I, when I walk through the door every day, I have this quote from Mother Teresa that says, if you want to bring happiness to the world, go home and love your family. And they be, mm. become my immediate sphere of influence. And being able to stay focused in that way um, can be enormously helpful. And we can talk, yeah, and Danny, I know you talk a lot about spheres of influence too in your work. Yeah, and I, I was just thinking, because Eric and Alex, you guys sort of set up this cool thing where we can, you know, volunteer helping out via video in New York City, right, for these three-hour shifts. And I think that the concept of a sphere of influence is just going to be different for all of us, right? But in those three hours, your whole mind and being is there. And then the minute I turn it off, at least, it's with the three kids who are probably waiting at the door for me to come out, right? Mm -hmm. But if you think about our colleagues in New York on the front lines right now, it's a very different sphere of influence, right? To be able to to focus on very attentively on just what's in front of you, I think helps us right now. But Carrie, I know you had a third thing. So I want- the, the, third, the third thing that is um, about sort of how do we keep ourselves grounded, Joan Halifax calls it having a balanced diet, a balanced emotional diet in our life. So our work is very emotionally intense. We have moments that are fulfilling and moments that are exhausting. So how do we have an awareness of what brings us consolation in our life and what brings us desolation and drawing upon actually those moments of consolation to carry us through the tougher times? And we all know what fills our cup. I mean, a lot of us use humor. I'm, um, mm-hmm. A lot of us use gratitude. Um, there are all sorts of practices that we know brings us consolation, allows us to have a more balanced diet. I know I personally have stopped consuming 
national and global news beyond about 10 minutes a day because there's enough suffering alone in the work that we do to go around. Yeah. I'm so, interested in yeah, and what you guys do too that maintains a balanced diet. Well, I think one of the the feelings that a lot of people have, including myself, we were on a podcast, uh, our last one with Kai Romero from Hospice by the Bay, and there's a sense of kind of survivor's guilt is that mm-hmm. we we see what's going on in New York and elsewhere. It's not happening here. Mm -hmm. to the extent it is there. We are incredibly lucky because we have the gift of time Mm -hmm. um, to get ready. So um, I think a lot of us are pushing a lot of focus on that preparation, 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 meetings, talking about the things that we're going to do if the surge happens. And it's somewhat relieving to actually to do that and to focus on that. But what happens is eventually... kind of running out of things to do. Yes. <laughs> and all of our energy has been focused on that. And then there's that, that sense of kind of that relief. Like we're just, we're picking and picking and picking it, and there's nothing yeah. left to pick at. It sort of reminds me of what you were saying earlier about how when it's hard to tolerate a feeling in a room, you're quick to want to fix it because there is something great about the fixing, Right. But I would almost take us back to where we started when you say that and say that really part of our work is to what we have to do all the fixing and preparing that you're talking about. But part of our work is to ourselves sit with this feeling, this uncomfortable feeling, this, this guilt, this anticipation, this mix between like gratitude and dread and unknown and that we can tolerate it so well that now we can create a holding space so that all the other people, all the other colleagues that we're working with, all the patients we're going to see so that we can sit with them and help them sit with it. Right. You asked me, you talked about how it's hard to not add that line on. And I'm saying sort of on a really meta level, don't add that line on air. <laughs> I'm thinking away. right now of Fred Rogers. And he says, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. And so if we can actually name that yeah. feeling of angst that we all have, then instead of it going out, at, instead of it becoming sort of the 500th protocol that we create, we can actually manage the emotion if we can yeah. name it. Yeah. In some ways, it's helpful to have that. I mean, part of like our desire to help our colleagues in New York is also part of our desire just to, I want to help. I want to do yeah. something. But you can take it a little bit too far, <laughs> uh, as, as noted by my constant Zoom meetings every 30 minutes. And that's why I think that altruism of us, you know, we know we have a particular skill set where maybe we can be helpful through televisits for New York. And so making that a sphere of influence, okay, the, I'm going to do these televisits for the next four hours. And that's my immediate sphere of influence for this moment of time in my life. And in this twisted way, I think it actually, as I hear you talking, Eric, I think it gives us a beautiful insight into what it might be like, not necessarily for patients in the pandemic, but just for the patients that we normally see, right? Like the rug got pulled out, their life got flipped upside down, nothing is in their control anymore. And we see patients grasping for things that they can do, things that they can hold on to, you know, can I, is there an herbal remedy? Let me, let me look into herbal remedies, right? We see patients in this state of like, oh my gosh, the world's flipped upside down. Nothing's in my control. These feelings are hard to tolerate and I need to channel them into something. We see it all the time. And now I think we're just getting a taste of it, right? The lines are blurred. We're all the victim a little bit right now. And it, it might be good for us to to be able to taste what it's like because we're we're sitting with a lot of people who are tasting this feeling constantly, right? Well, this has been great. Is there anything? Oh, so we, we're going to make sure we link to that article. We're going to link to the take out the trash. We're going to link to the prior <laughs> podcast about formulations. <laughs> Is there anything else that we should uh, discuss today, or any other resources out there? for our listeners who may be interested in learning more at this challenging time? Well, 
I mean, Alex, I think a little bit, you play with fire when you ask two psychiatrists if there's anything else that we can discuss today, because (laughs) Carrie and I could be here till tomorrow morning. Um, But Carrie, you did have a different article. The resource question's a bit easier. You did have a different article you wanted to share. Is that right? We'll we'll, we'll, We'll post some of the articles that are just good resources for thinking about this third element of therapeutic presence, therapeutic holding, and creating a holding environment with patients. But I think our main takeaways are within therapeutic presence, us being mindful of um, that level of attention um, and also um, creating the holding space for patients and how we're able to name the experience and those being incredibly valuable assets during this time of distress and anxiety. Yeah. And as the rules of the game have changed that we just have to You guys, we're all doing this at baseline, but right now we have to, have to, have to be intentional about grabbing for these basic ingredients. Well, I want to thank both of you for joining us. Um, Also for being my psychiatrist for the last uh, hour. Um, (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I I saw some holding uh, going on for me there. Um, Maybe we can end uh, with a little bit more of the friend song, Alex. All right, here we go again gonna have a different meaning for you this time <laughs> that's right so no one told you life was gonna be this way your job's a joke you broke your love life's the away I get it now. There's some holding going on there. Yes. <laughs> when the rain's friends falling, I'm going to be there for you. Who knew that Thank friends you. was actually like yeah. basic training yeah. in psychiatric principles? Listen, Never listen, said listen, I'm going to open joke my when umbrella. When I said great psychological dialogue, yeah. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Well, thank you both for joining us. Uh, Carrie, um, always, I think we got to have you back on because that was amazing. Um, and Danny, always great to have you on uh, the Jerry Bell podcast. Thank you, Eric and Alex. It's really been a pleasure. It's nice yeah. to see your faces. <laughs> and uh, as always, thank you, Archstone Foundation, for your continued support and to all our listeners for joining us every week. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, folks. <laughs>